Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today at Grey Matter. Today we have a collection of some of the updates for 2023 in the Prophecy Suite. Uh, we're gonna kick things off today with a presentation on iFix and then move on to Historian 2023 Ops Hub or Operations Hub and then round things out with simplicity. So if you have questions, you can post them online and we'll get back with you and our subject matter experts can help, but enjoy today's presentation. Thanks for being here. Hello, everybody. This is Greg Hazel again, uh, Solution Consultant here at Gray Matter Systems. And today's topic, we're going to do the top five reasons to plan your upgrade to iFix 2023. So um, 2023, I say plan because we have a mid-February uh, release target. And so now is the time to think about upgrading. Uh, what I want to do is talk about the uh, top five reasons that I think it might be good to upgrade. Uh, these may not be uh, in particular order. Uh, every customer has their own priorities. Um, but these are the things that I think are pretty compelling. So reason number one is ease of upgrade. And we're doing this because we've created a integrated installer. And the integrated installer allows us to install the common components and the different products in one common installation. So in the past, you might have noticed that if you wanted to install the historian, you had a separate ISO file to install the historian. If you needed to install the iFix product, there was an ISO for that. And lo and behold, if you wanted to install the industrial gateway server, which is one of the most popular uh, IO servers out there, that was another uh, installation. So uh, it was pretty arduous to upgrade, and it was time-consuming. What GE's done here for us is they created this integrated installer, and it lets you select the components or the features or the applications that you want to install. For instance, if I want to install a SCADA client, I simply select the SCADA client um, radio button here, and then go through the installation. We have that for the SCADA clients. We have it for the standalone SCADA server. So in that case, you are installing the SCADA server, the industrial gateway server, the historian, the productivity tools, the historian collector. So in one installation, uh, it will go through the complete install. Uh, also, any of the questions that it asks during the install is done up front. So if there are some um, prerequisites that you need to put in, it's going to be on the front side. And uh, once that's uh, satisfied, you can go ahead with the installation. Uh, each of these have a modify button. So if you don't want a particular option, maybe I don't want to install the productivity tools, or maybe I'm not using the industrial gateway server, I can hit modify here and then customize the installation. Uh, once that's complete, you're able to go get a cup of coffee, come back, do a single reboot, and you're good to go. So uh, it also installs our licensing information. So we have our common components that you see here, and this would be something like Operations Hub, licensing, prophecy authentication, and that type of thing. So I think that's pretty nice. Uh, the installer also allows you to do a silent install, so you can script some of that behind the scenes if you're doing many, many uh, installations. Uh, also, as far as uh, ease of upgrade, we look at our um, new improved uh, enhan enhanced backup and restore utility. This allows us to back up an older iFix project with the backup and restore utility. And what it will do is either a customized backup where you select individual components such as your picture, your database, drivers, et cetera, or you can hit full backup and just hit the full button here and it will back up the components that it needs. So it backs up your application, your project, the system configuration file, the picture files, tag groups, et cetera. Uh, it will back it up into a single FBK file. It's basically a zip file. Okay. Uh, once that's complete and you have your installation of the 2023, you can go down here and select the uh, restore. 
and the restore will allow you to uh, restore that project to your new iFix uh, 2023 installation. All right, moving right along, um, high availability. So we've made some improvements around, around high availability. So reason number two um, is centered around high availability. Um, in the past, we've had a uh, failover. So this is where we can have a redundant SCADA node where we typically have a primary and backup SCADA node, as you see. And in that instance, this gives you a level of high availability. Uh, the reason we do this, if you have a hardware failure or software failure, it will automatically fail over to a secondary machine. The secondary will become active and take over all the SCADA functions. Um, that was fine in the past, but we used uh, what we call a UDP protocol, which was a very high speed protocol. It allowed us to synchronize the database sub-second. Uh, that was good when you used the program block in the iFix database or the event action block or something that needed to be uh, attended to at a high rate. Um, in reality, most customers aren't using those uh, type of blocks and functions within their SCADA system. That stuff is done mainly in the PLC these days. Um, so with that said, we've added the TCP IP protocol here, and it's a selection now in the system configuration utility that you can set it up and now use TCP IP. The reason we're using that is TCP IP is routable. So we can go through switches and routers over your wide area network and have uh, our uh, SCADA nodes located in disparate locations. People often do this because they'd like a uh, SCADA server in either uh, on-premise in different rooms, case if we have some disaster in a particular um, room or a particular building. Uh, also, a lot of customers requested this because they wanted it to uh, have a disaster recovery uh, center. So. Many applications, oil and gas, for instance, they are dis, uh, disparately located from the equipment uh, and they could have a center control room downtown and another one uh, more local. So in this instance, we have one in Schenectady and another one in Foxborough and over the wide area network, it would be able to synchronize. We do this because we're using uh, packet compression and packet compression uh, allowed us to increase the performance uh, where we can still get a decent level of performance using that protocol. So um, another good reason to upgrade to 2023. Reason number three, centralized management. Uh, this is something that's been requested by customers for some time now. And it is going to give us the ability to manage our portfolio in a central location. Again, something that we haven't done in a few years ago, our centralized management is through uh, Configuration Hub. And Configuration Hub has been out within the iFix environment uh, for about um, three years now, probably three, four years uh, is our first iteration. So we're on our third generation of Configuration Hub. The 6.5, I believe it was introduced. And now with the 2023, we continuously in, uh, enhance it. What that allows us to do is manage our SCADA nodes. It allows us to manage our historian so we can do our SCADA management here. We can configure and manage our historian servers. We can manage our operations hub as well as uh, have that all done through a centralized configuration hub. So what happens behind the scenes is these different uh, in, um, nodes or installs are communication, com communicating with the configuration hub uh, when you do a configuration modification, uh, which is a um, really nice, nice thing to be able to do this centrally. 
Here's a screenshot of um, Configuration Hub. What you see here is a uh, ability to do centralized uh, deployment as well as configuration. This is, of course, it's browser-based, so you can have multiple folks configuring products simultaneously. Uh, they're all talking to a instance of Configuration Hub. On the side here in the navigation pane, you see that I have Prophecy Authentication. I have Operations Hub. I have a VM uh, 2023 and so on. So I can see my SCADA nodes, my historian all through this. And what happens is you have a series of tabs up top here that's going to show you uh, the section that you're configuring. So right here, I have my node settings. So the traditional uh, node settings that you have here where you have the start workspace and run mode or select your startup pictures, those types of things can all be done uh, centrally now. There's also centralized deployment. The centralized deployment allows me to publish these screens uh, or projects or color tables or recipes or tag settings or the process database itself to other nodes. So in a simple example, I might have a development SCADA node that I'm doing work on or a development terminal server that I'm doing my work on. And I'd like to propagate those displays to remote machines. Okay, so in the past, that has been always uh, a chore, all right? You're either sneaker netting the, uh, the uh, files around. As you know, picture files are, are just like Word documents. You need to move them to a common location or in a location on individual nodes. Uh, what we do here with the centralized management is we allow to publish that screen. Um, so if I make modifications to a picture, I can simply go in, select the picture that I want, select the node or nodes that I want to publish to, and that will then uh, take on the new graphic on the remote node. Okay, so I can do one or I can do many nodes at once. Okay. Number four is a common model. Uh, with modern controllers, um, your many integrators and customers are now familiar and taking advantage of a structured database or a tag structure uh, for a piece of equipment or even an entire process, okay? And with your SCADA, what we're moving away from is uh, the traditional flat tag database into a structured database. And what we've done is we've leveraged the, the model content and leveraged the IFIX database tags uh, to create structures. And those structures can be associated with individual pieces of equipment, such as a variable speed pump, or they could be associated with a complete process. So if you have a filter or you have an RTU in the oil and gas business, for instance, and that RTU has uh, 64 particular elements in it, and uh, typically in that business, you have many, many of them. So you may have hundreds or even thousands of those. Uh, by using the model, you can then create what we call a model type and then create what we call model instances. So once we create the model elements or the model type, we then instantiate model uh, element or instances. And so those would be instances of the actual uh, process of equipment. So at the end of the day, if you spend a little engineering time, a little time building the structure, standardizing on a structure, it's, it really makes a deployment uh, very fast, meaning I can replicate a process or a piece of equipment 
in seconds rather than building flat tag database uh, over and over and making sure my description is correct and my IO address is correct and all that kind of stuff. So common model, I'm a big fan of it. Um, reason number five, uh, centralized man uh, security. So in the past, we had uh, security that was individual to each product that we had. If you were using our historian product that integrated into the Windows group and you manage the uh, security groups all through the Windows environment, um, it would authenticate against your um, Active Directory. So the password would be, would be um, validated at that point. Same with iFix, you could do that and validate in the, um, in the um, Active Directory environment. But that's where as far as it went, it was individual uh, configuration for each of those components. What we've done here is we have centralized security through prophecy authentication, originally introduced as uh, UAA. So if you see the UAA in the uh, documentation, it is uh, branded prophecy authentication now. What it does is it allows us to build our security in a central location. So we're going to set up security and assign user rights, um, whether it's the historian product or configuration hub or iFix or operations hub. Each of those products will have security groups that can be assigned to a particular user. The user's gen then authenticated against your uh, Active Directory. It supports multi-factor authentication. Uh, it supports uh, nested AD groups. So this is our go-to security uh, mechanisms uh, going forward. You know, so this is really what we're what we've solved, and and as I said, right, what an industrial historian is really responsible for robust connection to uh, assets, collection of that data, storage of that data, and then exposing that data uh, to other applications for use cases like analysis, predictions, and optimizations. Right. So that I think if we look at that sort of yellow arc there, that's that's the core of what uh, of what customers think of when we think about an industrial historian. And so what we've now done, and you can move forward, Jeremy, is is you know help help solve that problem across the enterprise. And so as we as we do talk to customers, right, we do recognize that there are for many applications still a need for local high speed um, uh, um, robust data, uh, high speed historians. Um, and so, you know, there are, we have customers today that are looking at making that decision. Do I need to deploy on-prem uh, for very high speed applications? Cause I don't want to send all of that data to the cloud or do I want to, uh, do I want to just go ahead and, and deploy fully, uh, you know, deploy fully in the cloud, right? So we give, we, as, as we think about solving this problem, we think about, leveraging existing infrastructure. We think about giving customers choice of where they deploy. And we think about yet still providing um, a true historian that's cloud-based that bridges that OT to IT gap that help them uh, with the enterprise uh, analysis that they're, that they're looking to do. And so we introduced earlier this year, you know, Prophecy Historian for Cloud. Um, and there are a couple of key things here that um, that we built, right? So same uh, um, same APIs, zero integration effort. If you're already a Prophecy user, great, but we still maintain, you know, ma uh, many of the interfaces so that we provide interoperability of the historian. It just happens to be a different endpoint. The customer wants to use Excel to query the data. It doesn't matter if it's on-prem or in the cloud. It's just a different endpoint, just as an example. Um, we maintain all of the robust protocols that uh, support that we've had. So it really doesn't matter what your source of data. It could be machine tools via MT Connect. It could be smart sensors over MQTT. It could be directly out of PLCs or DCSs. 
uh, via proprietary protocols or frankly Modbus or OPC DA or UA. Um, it could be relational databases uh, through ODBC, could be other third party historians. Um, it, you know, we have connectivity to all of that infrastructure. So for those customers that have a variety of on-prem infrastructure in the plants, right? We give them one common way to connect um, and, and bring all of that data into a single normalized uh, time series. But from an IT perspective, it's deployed and managed through cloud-based technologies. We use Kubernetes, it's auto scaling, there's zero downtime upgrades. And, and when you think about the importance of doing data collection, not having to wait for downtime, not having to have an IT person on the weekends to do uh, um, server updates for the operating system or application version updates, right? Big benefit to the organization in terms of availability of data and a reduction in IT costs. Um, you know, we're working towards um, data replication and actually distributing the application across multiple geographic zones. So customers that have, say, European and North American plants, you know, the local users will, will be able to get the data from the local data center, um, but with auto failover across geographic zones. So again, you know, high reliability uh, across, uh, across the organization because this is critical data. Uh, we're just releasing the capability to do scheduled export to Parquet. Um, and, and, and while that, you may not know what that means, Parquet files are an industry standard file format. They're often used in, uh, in big data applications. But what that really means is it's super simple to now take the OT data and pipe it into the data lake to run analytics against it, to connect Tableau or Power BI, right? All of those IT oriented applications, it's very simple to, to deal with the data in this standard format. The other thing that we do is, um, you know, we make it easy for customers if they're making the choice to move, you know, we make it easy to do that. Um, there's no sort of streaming all of your legacy gigabytes or terabytes of data right, especially on the Amazon environment, you know, they have physical devices, you can basically do file copies of your historical data, ship it off to Amazon, they'll load it into your file space. So very low, uh, low effort to migrate uh, years of data uh, from on prem to the cloud. And we've done that. At the same time, all with a new new commercial model. So I talked before about uh, consumption based um, pricing, you know, we've broken the sort of mold on, on the way historians are, are, are purchased uh, as we move to the cloud and offer a true consumption-based pricing based on you know, the numbers of samples being stored or queried. Um, and it becomes much more cost-effective. Uh, there's effectively no upfront cost. Uh, there's no license price upfront. You're just, we've made it really inexpensive to store data because of the way we've architected the solution, it's very low cost from an infrastructure perspective to run. And, and so really what we've done here is align the, the cost to, for you as a user with the value, which is you're gonna pay as you're doing queries or reports or, or analysis on the data. Uh, you're paying almost nothing uh, to store the data, no matter how much you're storing. Next slide, please. So this this happens to be two screenshots out of one of our demo systems, and uh, it really shows that it took minutes to actually configure the what what um, tags out of the system did we want to export to Parquet. Once that process was flowing, right, we were able to see the Parquet files in in our Amazon environment, and then you know we could um, we used Athena. Uh, which is one of the Amazon tools to um, uh, to expose that data, both to QuickSight and to Power BI. So both of these sampled, you know, the building, the the configuring of the data, exposing it to um, to the IT infrastructure, and then building these dashboards. This whole process took about 15 minutes to to get from 
I've got data flowing into the historian. How do I expose it to the IT or, uh, tools? And then we built these two different dashboards and two different tool sets, right? And so what that, to me, what that really demonstrated was the power of the, of the sort of integration between the OT layer and the IT layer that, that we're enabling for our customers. Because we could have just as easily been piping this data into you know, SageMaker or any other uh, any other uh, uh, AI or ML based tool. Uh, we also have third parties that, uh, again, on the previous slide, I talked about all of our APIs were the same. You know, companies like Seek, who have for years have had a historian on prem uh, high speed interface, uh, Seek's SaaS offering will talk natively to historian in the cloud, and it took zero effort on their behalf because it we had maintained the uh, the APIs. Um, and so what that exposes is lots, there's lots of tool sets that can be used. GE has tool sets, and I think I've got a slide here later in the deck or, you know, around one of those. But our goal here is really to help customers both, you know, collect up that data from across the enterprise into historian type technology in a cost effective way, but then again, expose it to visualization, reporting, or analytic tools where it really helps them solve the business problem that they're going after, right? We have tools that help solve certain business problems. We know that there's lots of other tools that customers are looking to uh, to use. And so our goal here is really to, to cross that OT to IT uh, chasm and, and simplify the that, that whole, how do I get all my OT data from my plants up to the cloud so that I can then use other tools against it. Steve, do, do you have some examples of roles at a company that you would you would typically see um, someone using, you know, these dashboards right off the bat? Yeah. So, I mean, these were, these were just sort of, these were custom dashboards that we built using the standard widgets. I mean, ultimately, right. If you think about what people have used for years, you've used, you know, Microsoft Excel at the plant level, you know, to query a historian and, and build reports and build tables and view trends, right? This to me is the next generation because what it now does is it allows simple comparatives uh, of data coming from multiple plants, right? Because you've brought all that data up into a single data store and now you have these cloud-based tools that can allow you to, um, you know, either have the same the same dashboard and you just point to different data sets from different plants or you could be building dashboards so if you know i think the real question here is you know what as you said right what are those use cases you may have um you may have uh you know management folks that are that are already running tableau or power bi or you know, quick site dashboards for other parts of their you know managing of, of the of the operation, and so now here's just in the same tools that they're already using, they now have access to the OT data. Um, it could be, um, you know, we talked to a lot of customers today who are forming um, analytic strategy teams, and so right there they're out looking for what are those business problems that we want to solve. We talked to a lot of customers that have, you know, sustainability has become a big, uh, a big initiative across industry, um, even more so in Europe. It's a, you know, we get quite a pull there, and and often customers really are trying to understand, you know, to build, you know, or produce a given product which they produce in multiple plants. You know, where is it most energy efficient or water efficient um, to produce? And again, going back to what they're really trying to do is is meet overall, in this case, could be sustainability goals. They need to understand where are they best in class and then look for opportunities for improvement. So, um, yeah, so so to me, this is this is all about operational efficiency at whatever level in the organization. It's just now exposing the tool, the data to, to new sets of tools. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. This happens to be, I, you know, I touched on IT costs. You know, we're working with GD, GE Aviation right now. Um, you know, so just just from an IT infrastructure perspective, right? They today have um, historians in 32 plants. You know, they're going through um, a, in their you know a robust um, evaluation of the you know 
they, you know, they're, they're largely doing business with the government. They're, they've got to go through a validation uh, process, which, which is great. And they're, we're, we're helping them through that. Um, but they're, they, the, what they've done just from a, from an IT infrastructure and then from an IT labor cost, you know, they expect to reduce infrastructure costs by 20% and reduce their, their labor costs by $185,000. And that really comes from, they've got 32 plants. That's 32 Saturdays a year that someone's round robin shutting down servers because I can't do it during the week. You know, someone, you know, from IT is shutting down a server, doing operating system patching, you know, doing version upgrades, validation, and and bringing the, the server back up. Um, you know, they're th- th- those folks who I've I've known for many years are really excited to be getting their weekends back, right? And so, you know, that then also, by the way, impacts employee engagement and and happiness, right? This is a set of folks that now get their weekends back. Um, so, uh, just a just a ton of benefit just on sort of infrastructure. Uh, let alone the creation of additional value that they're going to get by combining. They probably won't because of data um, segregation. They, they'll they probably not bring all of the data from all 32 plants into a single historian. Um, they may break that. They will break it up into two or three sort of enterprise scale historians, but um, it does give them that, uh, you know, they still get all the benefit from zero downtime upgrades and and uh, all, all of the uh, IT infrastructure cost uh, savings. Does that come from like a redundancy security standpoint, having those separate historians for so many sites or? Um, in, in their case, it's really about, um, they've got some plants that do government business and some plants that do non-government business. So the government business plants have to be in GovCloud, which comes with a bit of extra um, burden right, from a security perspective of who yeah. has access all that to the, you know, non-government plants. And so that's really wh- why they're they're going to take that route. Gotcha. You know, and, and then I brought in, a, you know, I brought in a slide about um, a solution that we offer called Prophecy Operations Analytics, right, which is really, it, this is a cloud-based solution, really helping customers solve um, quality, throughput, energy efficiency, uptime, uh, asset reliability, and asset life-based applications. Um, and so, again, you need to securely and reliably get that data to the cloud to be able to run analytics against that data. And while it's possible for uh, a customer to um, configure a secure connection from the cloud down to the sites uh, to collect the data, most customers are not interested in um, in that, going through that um, that IT security effort, right? So the ability for our, for the historian for cloud to put a collector on prem, which is a a an encrypted outbound only connection to the cloud, it it dramatically simplifies the conversation with uh, with local IT security, right? There's no inbound port, and everything's encrypted, so it's you know, so there's no VPN connection that has to be set up. It's you know we've made we've made the the connection from the site secure and simple uh, with uh, with the historian for cloud uh, upper application. You know, I think, and so we're sort of wrapping up here, right? So as we think about this solution around you know hybrid cloud based OT data management, we allow customers to align with their existing IT cloud investments. You know, if you're, if you're uh, an AWS customer, you're looking for ways to, to, to consume AWS resources. You subscribe to this product in the AWS marketplace, you get to count uh, a portion of your spend towards your AWS um, volume commitments. And the same thing will be true with Azure as we deploy on Azure in the, after the first of the year. Yet it delivers this data foundation for operational um, optimization at the enterprise. Easily bring the data from all of your plants into a single uh, data store, allowing you to run your operations faster um, and and deliver better outcomes uh, through optimization based on comparatives uh, across, across the organization.
So if you've seen our uh, been following our Empower Ups in the uh, this year, we've had the Empower Up for iFix 2023. And some of these displays that you see here today might look sim similar. So um, due to the um, uh, vector graphics capability that uh, Amy and team has been adding to the product, uh, we built some displays that might look similar to SCADA type graphics. So what you see here on my screen is you see a mix of SCADA type graphics, these the little pump icons that are actually part of the product, as well as uh, event charts. So these are widgets that can uh, uh, display uh, events, and these events could be a product change, they could be steps of a process, or they could be as simple as, hey, is my distribution pump running or not? And very quickly, the user be able to see what my pumps have been doing over uh, the last uh, period of time. So those are uh, a mix of SCADA type widgets and native widgets that we traditionally have been using as more of a dashboarding type thing in Operations Hub. So what I'm going to do here is we'll just navigate to the main screen. And now you see a um, more of a SCADA type graphics where I can continue to mix uh, pumps and valves and tanks along with things like spark line widgets graph widgets, donut charts, uh, bullet charts. Uh, so we're using these out of the box widgets with either native or custom based uh, vector based graphics. You also see that I have an alarm object at the bottom. And so I can look at that either as a alarm object, object on my screen, or I can go in and make a full screen uh, alarm display, very similar that you use in a SCADA system. Uh, with that, you have the capability of a lot of the out-of-the-box features. So part of the operations hub and the environment we're trying to provide is not having to build everything from scratch. And if you wanted to filter alarms based on a severity or something of that nature, I could certainly go in there and just pick this configuration. There's nothing to build here. You plop the, uh, the widget on display and you're good to go. So uh, in addition to that, we've had our traditional uh, um, analysis chart. So this is where we're able to put our analysis chart on our display. It has all sorts of capabilities, including uh, adding notes to your chart. So if you want to add a note or do ad hoc configuration, uh, maybe add a pen to your note, you can cer certainly do that just by selecting a, um, a tag either by a model or by the uh, historian tag browser and add it to your chart. So as I do that, if I wanna plot a new point, I simply just check box it here, add it to my chart. If I wanna remove a point, I can just do that as well just by clicking over here. So you notice I'm in the runtime environment doing this. The idea with the whole uh, analysis chart is to have it, to empower the end user, not have to have a technical person build one and hard code a chart for you. Uh, as I said, there is the notes capability where you can add a note to your chart as well. Well, so you can stick your new note in there and save it as part of your chart. And uh, anyone can, uh, it has access to notes, would be able to see that note just by clicking on it and drilling into notes. You can also put multiple notes on the uh, same chart. So this charts continuously be enhanced. The newer versions of support stacked axes and things of that nature. Um, so continuously to be enhanced over the period of time, as well as doing things like putting uh, multiple cursors on here and looking at the delta of values. So all that is... Um, <clears throat> Uh, available mixing standard widgets with graphical widgets. So uh, with that, let me go into, you know, how was this stuff built? How, how would I get into the configuration environment? I'm going to just hit my favorites over here, and I'm going to go into configuration hub. <clears throat> As Amy says, we've built uh, the configuration to build a single uh, development environment to monitor and build all aspects of the GE portfolio. So I can monitor my security. I can monitor my historian. If you were here with us last month, you were looking at our SCADA capability where we could go in and build our tag database. We could build our uh, equipment model. 
all through uh, Configuration Hub. Uh, the team for Operations Hub is also built in Operations Hub, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So as I go into Operations Hub, I can select the applications, and now you'll see the application that I just demonstrated in the runtime environment, my distribution station, my pump cycles, my alarms, my analysis, and so on. Um, as you're in this environment, you'll get a series of tabs, so you can move between uh, different aspects of Configuration Hub. When you're working specifically in the um, Operations Hub environment, we're gonna go into Designer. We have the paintbrush icon up here in the top left. And I'm gonna say yes to that. And it's gonna move me into a full design environment for Operations Hub. In that environment, you'll see that I now have my application and a series of pages underneath. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna add a new page. So simply right click, add a new page. And this is going to be my uh, storage tank. And we're going to add our new page for our storage tank. As you see on the left-hand side is our widgets. So we have our widgets categorized by type, charts, displays, general, HMI, inputs, layouts, etc. cetera. Um, and this library is conti continually being built out. So... Um, as ideas come in and requirements come in, these uh, widgets uh, um, are enhanced and uh, in each release. As Amy says, occasionally, if need be, uh, a widget can be built by um, some uh, development folks. So uh, with that, I'm going to grab my standard art gauge as we used in the past, drop it on the screen. And um, save that display. And uh, now with that display, I can go under my data tab and I'm able to see my uh, north distribution tank. And with that distribution tank, I can expand that and select my tank level. And so this is a historian tag that I can drag and drop it onto my display. Uh, once that's done, we're gonna go ahead and save that. And then we're gonna go over and launch that. Okay, so we just built a page and now we're launching our page with our simple donut chart. Okay, with the time we have remaining, we're going to add a couple more things. We're going to go into uh, our operations hub. We'll go back into visuals. And as Amy said, we have the uh, HMI graphics that are part of the product. I'll just drag that onto the page. And as you see, when I do that, there's a series of properties and details that are exposed on the left, on the right hand side. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to bind that to a data source. So in our tag browser, we're going to bind that to an iFix value. So the iFix value is going to give me a list of my iFix tags here in the list. So what we're going to do is just look through our tag list and select our pump status screen our pump status uh, tag and expand that. And I'm gonna grab the value of that and we'll drop that right onto our pump, okay? And once that's done, we can again save it and uh, go into our environment. I like to use this tube tab environment. So I have a configuration environment and another tab with the uh, storage tank or, or the uh, runtime environment. So a simple refresh will put my pump back on the screen and you'll see that it probably will turn on and off here throughout the uh, display as I just have the value toggling uh, in the background. As we um, go through that, uh, as Amy said, we have the uh, environment where we can go back into our visuals 
And down here at the bottom, we can build our own graphics. So if I want to add a new tank or a new graphic, right click, add new graphic, and it allows me to create a new graphical object. If you're um, familiar with SCADA systems, dynamos and symbols and all sorts of stuff, different uh, packages call it, these would be uh, similar to that type of deal. So we'll call this our H2O uh, tank here and add our graphic. Okay. Once that graphic is there, I'm going to hit and edit the graphic. Notice that's bringing me into a new designer, right? It's bringing me into a new designer to build out these F SVG graphics. So I'm going to expand that and uh, just zoom in. So I'm building it at a 400% uh, ratio. Uh, once that's done, I can go in and select my different uh, I, my different tools. So I'm just going to plop down a rectangle in here, and there is the beginning of my tank. Uh, don't really want a red tank, so we're going to pick a color for that tank. Uh, as well as maybe I don't want the edge on it, remove the edge, and I can also uh, maybe make it rotate it here and. Uh, Put different, uh, change different uh, aspects of this tank the way you want it to, to look and feel. Okay. And down here, you'll see maybe we'll make it uh, more tank like. We'll make some rounded edges and you're good to go. Uh, next thing we're going to do is we'll add another rectangle and we'll plop that down. And this will outline our um, vertical fill. And uh, let's go put a piece of text on here just for uh, grins. So this will be our this will be our storage tank. And of course, uh, maybe we'll make that a little smaller here. And we can also size it manually with just by dragging it around. Um, with that done, we're going to um, add a, another value here, and we're just going to call this uh, value. And why I did that is as I click on it, I can go and change the font of it, change the size, uh, change the color and whatnot, and move that around. So I'm building out my custom graphic. Once that's done, simple enough, I select the part of the graphic that I want to animate, right click it and add an animation. I'm going to add a fill animation here. And I'm also going to go to my value animation and I'm going to right click and hit add data link animation. So good to go here. I'm going to save that graphic and allows me to build out that uh, graphical object here in just a few minutes. Uh, let's go back into our designer and go back into our graphics and you'll see I now have my HTO tank available. I'm going to drag that onto my page. We'll go ahead and size that. And what you see on the right is my properties are now exposed. It built the, the animated vector graphic and attached these properties and, and animations to that object. Uh, from there, all we need to do is go back into our page data and select our values. So Let's go ahead and select our uh, tank level tag. So we need a, a tank level. We're going to select the value of it. This data is coming in directly from OPC UA uh, to the um, element. So I'm going to tag and drop that onto my tank. And you'll see that it bound to my tank by the message up top. And I'll just save that. So let's go into our... Uh, graphic, and then refresh, and uh, lo and behold, I have a tank, and with a value changing, and all within uh, just a few minutes. Again, if you want to make changes to this, the property are exposed. If I don't like that color blue, I can pick another color blue or change different aspects. My engineering units, um, you can add all sorts of things to the uh, tanks and animated objects. So again, just uh, all the changes, working in a two-tab environment, simply refresh the running tab, and uh, you'll see your changes where I have a uh, kinder color blue 
for the storage tank. So pre-built um, um, widgets that are part of Operations Hub. We have our new vector based graphics with animations that are part of the product, as well as building your own uh, vector graphics with animations. So a lot has changed with Operations Hub uh, over the last year. Uh, excited to work with the product. So in terms of simplicity, this is just a really high level uh, overview. Obviously, um, you know, it's a very, very full featured SCADA, HMI SCADA solution. Um, you know, so I just sort of highlighted some of the key things, um, you know, that around the product itself. Um, you know, we do have some unique capabilities in terms of things like production tracking that a lot of our automotive customers use, um, which is an add on to simplicity to really look at. You know, how, you, how we can help you manage and track assembly operations, as an example. Um, we've got some cool capabilities around things like our digital graphic replay, which actually let you use your exact your same application, but run it off historical data. Um, you know, so there's a capability that's been in the product a while. I like to highlight it because for some reason, not a lot of people know about it. But idea here is you log your data to a story and you're running OK something happens at two in the morning, you all, you kind of want to rewind your uh, HMI to see what was going on. So you can go back to two in the morning and play it back and see um, how things are behaving. Um, from a development perspective, Simplicity has been um, very object oriented for a long time. Um, you know, so we do allow, have the concept of being able to create classes or object types, tie all the all the alarming, the visualization, uh, you know, various configuration to that class. So when you create a, a, an object, it automatically builds everything for you, including the graphics and the uh, database. You know, so very, this area is very rich. And I know we've done some enhancements in recent release as well to make it even better. Um, extensibility. And um, I have a quick overview on the previous release, but um, you know, Python is something we've added. Some extensibility has always been a strength. You know, we do have full APIs, et cetera, but we have added Python in the previous release. So you can now leverage Python from a scripting perspective as well. So the original scripting languages still are in there. They work, um, but it just gives you the option now to use Python, which is, uh, you know, a much higher level, richer scripting language um, with tons of libraries available. Um, we are adopting a lot of open standards and continue to, including things like OPC UA. Um, with this upcoming release, we're going to also be adding MQTT, so I do have it highlighted already there. But the idea behind supporting these standards is really, you know, we know we're not the only part of your control system, you know, but we want to make sure that you can interact and interoperate um you know with other systems that you might have in play it as well you know whether they're cms systems or or um, other control systems and things like that um simplicity itself um i don't know how many on the call have have managed to um, take advantage of it but it is a very highly scalable solution um, we've got customers with over half a million points on a server for example and even some that are doing redundancy, you know, in close to those numbers. So, you know, depending on your application and data rate change and stuff, you know, the, the cool part about Simplicity is you can scale it high. It does have the tools to handle those large databases and, um, you know, hopefully should help reduce the, you know, the IT infrastructure requirements and things like that for your overall solution. So again, you know, lots of capabilities. Um, it's been building over time and we continue to enhance and modernize as we, as we go along. In terms of the most recent release, as mentioned, um, you know, one of the key areas that we had in our Simplicity 22 release is, um, you know, the Python support. So we added the capability to um, script with Python. Um, we also um, spent some time um, working on um, cloud infrastructure as well. We've got more and more customers that are starting to uh, move to the cloud, at least some of their systems. Um, what we're seeing in at least the automation side of things is more of a hybrid approach, meaning the most critical systems that you know just can't be down being on site and putting auxiliary systems uh, in the cloud. So we do have 
we have qualified and made sure that um, you can take simplicity and install it in uh, cloud infrastructure as a using the infrastructure as a service. And we do actually have a lot of documented uh, sample architectures on our documentation site as well. So you can look at them. And um, in terms of uh, the connected worker, you know, we did make some uh, on the visualization side, we made some enhancements to the uh, alarm visualization. And we'll be continuing to do more and more of that in the future as well. So these are just some examples of that cloud infrastructure I talked about, you know, just being able to have combinations of simplicity on site in, pre, uh, you know, servers on in the cloud with uh, some servers on site or all the servers in the cloud and just visualize a, or sorry, servers on site and visualization in the cloud and anything in between, you know. So again, we just wanted to kind of make sure that you you do realize that that is a an option as well for you. Um, so we do have a new version that will be coming out in Q2. And um, these are just some of the highlights. Um, and I'll go through some of these in a little more detail. Um, one of the really big things that we're, we've been working towards is our new HTML5 based HMI solution. Um, you know, so um, I think, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, I don't know if it was Dennis or someone mentioned earlier about um, operations hub, you know, as some of the things that um, we have, we'll have some more information on. And I'll go through this in a little bit more detail, but ultimately what we got is our new operations hub, which is our web client for our portfolio. And it has been enhanced to uh, enable um, H, uh, HTML5 based HMI style capabilities. So we'll cover that a little bit more. Um, the idea here is um, you can, um, from a web browser, you can, can create displays and run the displays um, using a web browser as well. So that's all native, um, in addition to some of the capabilities we have today with web space and terminal services, it does give you another thin client type of option as well. Um, as part of our overall strategy, um, I kind of touched on some of the central management and deployment things. Um, you know, so this is something that we're going to continue to uh, move forward on, and you'll see a lot more of that in the 2024 release and beyond. But um, we're also, in addition to the HTML5 from a visualization perspective, um, we've also got the concept of our configuration hub, which is the web-based configuration tools that we're going to be that we're building up as well. And um, we've taken a baby step, at least, to start getting simplicity into that environment. And you'll start seeing more and more of our configuration move to web-based configuration in that environment as well. Um, you know, so. Other parts, you know, other kind of key things here, um, you know, and, and I'll touch, I touch on it a little bit here because it's really in support of the HTML5. You know, as mentioned previously, Simplicity does have classes and objects. Um, when you develop your HMI, whether it's, you know, the classic uh, Simplicity Viewer HMI or the new HTML5 HMI, um, you can, you um, leverage a model to really help structure out your application and your displays. So with um, the release as well, we'll be able to have um, the simplicity model that's you've built already potentially um, be exposed so that you can leverage it as part of the uh, HMI design. Um, another kind of key area is around authentication. Um, we do have a common authentication that we are using across our portfolio now called Prophecy Authentication. Um, and that is uh, something that we'll be supporting in the 2023 release. And, and really this is kind of in line with, um, you know, being able to do some of that common configuration and uh, in the web environment, you know, if you are using our historian or in our plan applications or any of our other products, um, you'll see all our products use this and this will really be a time saver in terms of having that single sign on across the portfolio. So you'll be able to log in once and access multiple products, as an example. Um, security and high availability are always some key things that we focus on. Um, so from a security perspective, um, we've added some capabilities around digital screen signing. So what this means is, you know, as um, you create displays, um, as many people know, you can do things like put scripting in displays and almost do anything you want in those displays. So 
Um, there can be a potential for somebody getting a malicious screen on your system and that type of thing. What the digital screen signing does is ensures that um, screens haven't been tampered with from your original uh, um, creation, so to speak. So this is something that, you know, we've done in conjunction with our power business. Um, you know, in the power industry, there's a lot of, uh, you know, they're quite security conscious. So this is just sort of another way of ensuring that tampering hasn't occurred. Um, so again, before it'll run, if you enable this capability, before it'll actually open and run the screen, it will make sure the signature is valid on that. Um, we're also going to be introducing OPC UA client server communications. So again, all the traditional simplicity client server stuff will still be there and exist. Um, but we, we will be adding the option so that you can use just pure uh, OPC UA to connect our client to the server. Um, and one of the reasons behind this is, again, kind of a security thing and why I kind of have it in the security area is OPC UA is a, um, you know, a certificate based um, communication if you so choose to enable it. Um, so this is just another way of ensuring that clients and server have that established trust and, you know, again, that somebody can't just run any, you know, install a client and uh, start you know, communicating to the server and doing something with it, um, it, do, it would have to be um, trusted in order to allow that. So again, these are just some of the, a couple capabilities really to enhance um, uh, um, options around securing your system. Um, and then another thing that we've done from high available, we'll, well, we'll be releasing, I guess, from a, a high availability perspective is, um, you know, today, if you want to do like, complete pro you know update a complete project you know not dynamic changes which are obviously already there but if you wanted to update you know project files and stuff like that you typically do need to stop the server um, so what this capability is going to allow you to do is update the project files or sorry uh, force a failover update the project files you know revert back and it'll automatically sync so your systems uh, up and running with the new project. And the idea here is so that you can, uh, can do wholesale updates of projects without um, downtime. And so that's just uh, a key capability just to keep your system up and running. And um, kind of the other key thing that'll be coming out in the release is our MQTT5 support. Um, you know, so that that's really um, the protocol. I, I have a couple slides on it, but you know, um, it's really the protocol of choice for IoT type systems. So if you want to do site to cloud and things like that, um, it is a, a protocol of choice. And um, but we do actually also see smart sensors and even using the protocol um, in on premise, not just for cloud applications, um, just as a standardized way of uh, moving data around between applications. You know, so again, lots of rich capability there. Uh, one of the things that Jimmy touched on was like the screen signing. Um, that's something that's coming out that the, there will be the certificates. It's, you know, the X509. Uh, there's some that are concluded with, with simplicity, or you can use your own. If you had to bring, want to bring your own certificates in, you could do that. And it's done with a command line tool, the, uh, the SIM sign tool. So you can sign the screens. And like Jimmy said, it's, it's going to create a, a lock on it. Uh, so it's going to protect it from someone else injecting some code or something in there that might um, change your operation just with your to protect that um, other one is alarm viewer enhancements uh, this new coming out is supposed to add up to 512 characters so that quite a bit of information that'd be available um, you know if anybody has done is trying to been limited in some of the hmis that you trying to make a code of acronyms to make it easy to read at the same time um, you, know, you wouldn't want to create a dissertation for your operators to try and understand what's there, but given a good message, this definitely opened up the, the limitation to some degree. And then with that, they also had the ability to, if you've got 512 characters, it's probably going to overrun your screen. So now there's a slide bar function that you can read across the, the uh, alarm messages and see what's there. And also another little enhancement was they also added the right to left. So this would be more for like, uh, languages of say Arabic or Hebrew that would have those. So again, some of it might not be as common here in, in America or the, or the States, but 
again, the Middle East, this would definitely be something to be appreciated. Um, the other thing is like the navigation tree. There's been some changes there. You know, it seems like either people love it or hate it. Uh, it's uh, definitely going to add some better functionality since it's now going to be able to be a pop up. It can be scripted to move where it's going to be on the screen or changing the size of the function. So that's definitely going to add more um, custom customization to it so that you can make it how you want. Another one they're adding to is also this uh, Chrome browser integration. You know, I haven't had a chance to see this one in action yet, but again, it's going to add another another tool there, and this will be done through the Sim Edit. You'll make that um, addition to add that you know functionality there. And then, as far as like what Jimmy talked about, the prophecy authentication support, is that all integrates in? You know, you'll be able to use your users from Simplicity there into um, you know, your configuration hub, and you can see those and you know, again, set up the access and who they can, where they can go. Another part of that too is with the um, projects. Uh, when I brought the project into Simplicity and then set up through Authentication Hub, you can kind of see where the um, my computer was also, you know, it went through authentication. Then the project itself was authenticated, and then also there's the the groups. They've added a new um, systems group so that you can again set up who will have access and limit and you know modify. Who can go where? So. And then in configuration, the plugin again, that's where your simplicity, the project will be able to come in. You can see where it's going to have the uh, the project itself, and then from your points as you're adding and bringing those in. And it's kind of again another look at what the MQTT, like what uh, Jimmy talked about, you know, is just again the map of the devices in the field coming through. You know, a client you know can go to configuration hub. And from there, be passed to the other uh, parts of your SCADA, whether it's Simplicity or Historian. And again, giving more of that data transfer and, and making it accessible. And just again, this is kind of the same slide that Jimmy already touched on about, you know, just the overview of some of the changes and what's going to be available and how it's going to, you know, just the progression of how it's getting better. And, and they're, again, driving this forward. So I think it's going to be MQTT is, again, coming to be such a uh, popular language for those kind of low bandwidth communications and things that it's, it's definitely a, a wave of the future. I think it's coming with all of that. 